Okay. I actually have the two products from her poppy with me right now. I tried them when I got them okay. and I really like them. And okay. I'm, I'm kind of excited to try them um, for my upcoming period. Yeah. So I'll see how it goes. Please, please yeah. let me know. Please let me know. I'm really mm-hmm. excited that you got them too. Shall we start with the conversation? Let's go ahead. I want to just have a few questions. Actually, this is our second time meeting. And I think is when okay? we first met, is it okay if I have my water and coffee throughout? It's okay. No, it's okay. okay. I also have um I also have my coffee and my water okay. next to me. We have both at the same <laughs> Yeah. We we need both to survive this morning. Right. <laughs> this conversation is also kind of like a way for me to get to know you a bit more personally beyond her poppy and what we talked about in yeah. the last meeting. Uh, why don't we start off first with the first question? Uh, where did you grow up? And sharing a little bit of background that made up who you are today. Yeah, um, I actually grew up in quite a few places. And so when when people ask me where I'm from, I say where. <laughs> I was born in Arlington, Texas. And then shortly after that, um, I believe maybe when I was five years, around four or five years old, we moved to um, West Palm Beach, Florida. Spent a lot of time there and I have a lot of family in the Midwest, so the Chicago, Milwaukee area. So I would spend a lot of time and at one point lived in the Midwest with my family as well. I lived in, in uh, Georgia for a while, um, finished high school in, in Georgia. And then after that, um, went back to Florida. I lived in, I lived overseas. I lived in China for a summer. That was actually, oh, you did? I did. Wow. That was actually one of the best things I, I could have done at that time af- after graduating school. Um, I wasn't sure. I generally knew what I wanted to do with my career, but mm-hmm. I know I wanted to be in marketing, but didn't know how to pursue it at the time. I got, after finishing my internship in China, I moved to New York for almost 10 years. Now I am back in the Atlanta area. And I've been here for four years, I think maybe going on five now. The idea of moving around so much, I started to become a bit fearless with things like Mm. that, I guess. Picking up, staying in the same place for a long time and and picking up and and starting something or doing something grand, Mm. kind of always, I was always entering into a new friendship circle. It just that I know a lot of that moving around and adapting and being kind of fearless and and finding your way through, you know, these new cities, new people that you're meeting, new schools that you're going to. It definitely, it it for sure shaped, had an impact and and shaped the, the woman that I am today. My mom, she let me pursue the things that I always wanted to pursue. I remember the first business I started, I took my grandmother's cake recipes and thought that I wanted to be a baker. (laughs) I was in high school and then actually, no, I'll rewind. And my mom actually supported me with this. My first business was selling lollipops in middle school. She would buy me the bag of Jolly Rancher lollipops. I don't know if they're still a thing these days, but buy me a bag of Jolly Rancher lollipops. I would take them to school and sell them for 25 cents. And I got in trouble doing that. <laughs> but I had I had a good thing going for a while. And so my mom was always the person to be very supportive. And if I had an idea and wanted to to do something that I always thought I want to always wanted to do like big grand things. And, you know, if I always thought it was big grand and I always had a plan for it, she would let me do it. She would just she would support me and, and tell me essentially, you know, that that she's always here and I always had someone to fall back on. So the idea of, of being an entrepreneur, it was never that word, I guess, never really resonated or was never really top of mind for me. I would just go start things, would get into them and realize that I didn't necessarily like doing the things sometimes. I started a budgeting business at one point. I'm really good at budgeting. 
I'm so good at budgeting, creating a budget, sticking to the budget. I think that came from my very first overdraft fee that I got when I got my first checking account in high school. And I didn't understand, I didn't fully understand how checks worked at the time. So I wrote a check and, you know, paid something with it. And I thought that the money came out immediately, but I don't think the money came out until like three weeks later. So I was like spending what was in my account. So from there, and my my dad actually instilled the idea of budgeting in me. I thought I wanted to start a home organizing business. They were always things that I liked to do for myself and maybe did them for, you know, would be willing to do them for other people, you know, friends or family close to me. But they were things that I ended up stopping because I realized I didn't actually want to do this for, for other people. I just, I just like doing it for myself. You, you worked in China for a bit and then you came back to New York. What, what did you do in New York, actually? My major was in marketing um, in college. Actually, that ended up being my third major. I changed my major. And so marketing ended up being the major that I that I settled on. And that actually came from working with my, my mom, worked in marketing. While I was in high school and college, she was able to hire me uh, mm. through some, it's like a third party contractor or something, but hire me to to actually work with her. And I always thought mm-hmm. that that was the coolest thing that I got to work for this financial institution under my mom. I'm in mm-hmm. high school and I get to go do these cool things. So I graduated with a marketing degree. And when I moved to New York, actually, I did not work in marketing right away. <laughs> I actually moved to New York with no job. Okay. I moved to New York with no job. I had a plan, though. I think I had saved $5,000 dollars in in cash at the time I was maybe in my early I was maybe 21 or 22 something like that mm. I think probably closer to 22 23 now that I think about it but yeah I'd saved um five thousand dollars I didn't have a job I had a resume I had my dad and other people helping me get my resume together and I bought a one-way ticket to New York I had a friend from college her mom would actually rent out her basement And I remember she didn't take me, she didn't take me that serious when I told her I wanted to rent out her basement. She was charging me like $500 for the month to rent mm-hmm. out her basement. But I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I rented out her basement in Long Island, New York, and I would commute into Manhattan every day with my resume looking for a mm-hmm. job. And I was walking into all of the big, I remember walking into CBS and walking into Viacom. And sometimes they'll send you around to the back and say, you know, take it to this person. I remember a woman at CBS, they actually let me upstairs into the building and I was able to mm. give my resume. I think it was the admin assistant to whatever this marketing person was. And I just thought that was the coolest thing at the time. And I definitely thought yeah. I was going to get a phone call back and I never did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But my first job ended up being at a bank, actually. I wanted to, I got a job. I ended up wanting to get a job very quickly so I could get an apartment and just, you know, mm-hmm. kind of start to live a little bit. So my first job was at the bank. And then maybe two years after that, I got the kind of job that I actually wanted, which was in market research. And so mm. I ended up, um, I ended up working for an agency for a little while. And then um, I ended up working for a startup, which was actually my favorite job that I had in New York. I was working for a sampling company and I got mm. to it was a really cool experience. We got to do uh, market research for almost any product that you can think of that is in like a grocery mm. store or a Target for all of the coolest brands, some of the brands that I had been buying for so many years. Mm. So then since then until you founded Her Poppy, yeah. what what yeah. happened? What led you to oh, where you are right now? That... <laughs> It feels like it came from two sides, if if this kind of makes sense. Right. I'll start with with what I I look at as as the first side. My dad um, passed away from pancreatic cancer when I was um, 26 years old. It was a few days after his 57th birthday, actually. My dad had always been, you know, he was always a very healthy person, you know, and how he ate and exercising and and lived and. And loved people. Um, he had always talked to me about making sure I'm exercising and taking care of my body and, you know, maybe playing a sport here and there. And I had gotten to a place in my life where I, I really, I wasn't taking care of myself that well. 
he was actually the third generation in a row to pass away from pancreatic cancer. It was his grandmother, and I believe actually his grandmother's sister as well, uh, but it was his grandmother, his mom, and then he ended up passing. Mm-hmm. I remember him, you know, talking about having conversations with the doctors, you know, saying, well, you know, what can I do for my daughter? And they essentially said, just live a healthy lifestyle. They said that there wasn't anything that they could do to kind of prevent. There was no early testing or screening or things like that. Um, He, after he passed away, maybe a year or two later, I really got you know, serious about taking care of myself. And I found an exercise. There was a a boutique like gym that I really loved going to um, near my apartment. Some really great people there. I had gone completely plant-based and just was really enjoying this new approach to life. One of the things that I still experienced was very painful periods though. I have been prescribed birth control since the age of 15 for my painful periods Mm -hmm. and had gotten off in my mid twenties, but was still having to take ibuprofen. I was getting ibuprofen 800 milligrams prescribed for my gynecologist for my painful periods. And then fast forward. So this kind of personal transition is happening. And that really great startup that I told you about in New York, I actually ended up getting laid off Mm -hmm. and that that one actually hurt it it hurt pretty bad but i knew i knew it was a sign because i had actually been feeling like it was time to leave new york i would say for at least maybe about 2 years before i actually left i knew it was time to leave but i didn't know mm. i didn't know like what was next okay i feel like it's time mm. to leave but you know just kind of like i felt like i kind of sat still until i knew what what the next step was And so I ended up getting laid off. I took some time to think about what felt like the next best thing to do. And I ended up coming back to Atlanta. When I got back here, I hated it. I Mm. hated everything (laughs) about it. (laughs) My family was here, but I didn't really have a friend circle. I wasn't Mm. as familiar with the city. I would come back and visit, obviously, my family, but wasn't as familiar with the city and just really fell out of place, I guess. And so it actually ended up being a pretty low point. I I didn't have a job at the time either. Mm -hmm. And so I remember going to this event with the intention of being, there was another founder, actually. She's in the the women's health feminine care space. And I had always, I had been using her brand's products at the time. And it seemed like a very intimate curated event. So I thought it would be a cool way to, you know, maybe get to meet her um, and work for her company, actually. <laughs> that would be mm-hmm. a, cool way to very meet her, a cool way to meet her and, and some other people in the city as well. I was sitting there listening to her and, and there were some other founders and the idea or the, I call it the vision for her poppy, it just, I feel like it dropped at me like a ton of bricks. Mm. And I remember going home to my mom and saying, I know what I'm supposed to do now. Mm. For for a few months, I had just been spinning my wheels and going back and forth. And I actually considered going back to New York, you know, after being in Atlanta for a while. I remember I just had tears falling down my face. I said, I know what I'm supposed to do now. I think I got to work like the next day on mm. the formula things started to unfold from there and and here we are wow and from the beginning you didn't have like a co-founder or anyone working on it with you no and you work on it from home yeah wow I think for the first two years maybe even two and a half years it was myself just not knowing I knew I had I knew I had a product and I knew I had a product that worked and I used my background of market research to I put together a focus group that's actually why I fell in love with market research was focus groups but yeah I put together a focus group and I knew how to build surveys the right way based on my career just looking into formulation and and trial and error really in a lot of research. I went through like six versions of the formula before I I ended up testing it on myself and it worked on myself. Um, Mm. And then I put together this focus group. 
think it was maybe six to eight women and they were all in my network but from like different backgrounds um some are in our medical doctors some are in the fitness industry some are in the beauty industry some are just general advocates for you know women doing great things <laughs> i got overwhelmingly positive feedback and that's when i knew okay this this, this is, is what, what this is do. what i can introduce to the world yeah you mentioned that you got prescribed birth control for your period cramps. And it seems like in the United States, a lot of people have a hard time trusting the healthcare system. And when we talk specifically about menstrual health, why do you think that is the case? Um, there is an understanding, I would just say people of color in general. And then <laughs> there is this understanding that for the most part, most of the systems, the institutions that are in place are not built to to benefit people of color. And that's not by accident. When it comes to women specifically, I think if we just kind of take a look at, at history and think about how things, certain women's movements came about and the feminist movement, you know, the idea of women being left out, not considered, looked at as less than, that definitely translates, you know, into the healthcare system. And I don't know, I don't know the the stats on this. If you look at things through that lens of most of the time introduced institutions traditionally um, being ran by white men, and I don't, I don't say that in a way like all white men are, you know, are inherently bad, but that's what it is. And then the idea of white men at the time, you know, just kind of being at the head of, of everything. A lot of institutions and, and systems in place were designed for whatever they thought was right, designed for their benefit, et cetera, et cetera. That's essentially, in a lot of ways, we're still dealing with the effects of that, even if there is, and there, and there has been change that has happened over time, but it's something that we're still dealing with. And when it comes to women's menstrual health, the purpose of your menstrual cycle is, is essentially a series of hormonal changes that your body goes through in preparation for a pregnancy. And the idea is, well, if you're not having a baby, we're not trying to have a baby, then there really isn't a whole lot to talk about. So if you've got symptoms, let's just quiet the symptoms. That's not the case. You know, for women, our menstrual cycle is an indicator. If you can look at it, you can consider it a fifth vital sign. And there's a book that I read about that, um, Dr. Lisa Hendrickson. This is the same way our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiratory rate, you know, all of all of these other vital signs that are checked if you were to go into the emergency room for women, our menstrual cycle should be treated as such. The idea of women not really trusting the healthcare system with this, this aspect of their health, and I think many aspects of, of our health, it comes from no one really wanting to to take a second look. For the, I mean, not say no one, but for the most part, the experience, there's no need. Catch all, if you've got symptoms, let's just quiet the symptoms, because I think we know the healthcare system is not designed to keep you, to make you healthy and make you well. They make money off of you being sick. That's a whole other conversation that can be had there, but... Yeah. I think that as an international student, um, the stress of paying for the services and insurance adds on to the lack of trust to the healthcare system here. Now I want to go deeper into our conversation about menstrual wellness. When you had, you experienced your period for the first time, what was it like? Did people tell you what was going to happen to you or the explanation behind it? Um, no. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I think my mom and I vaguely, I'll, I'll say it vaguely. I don't, rem I can't recall having many conversations before. And I think I would, just because I was an inquisitive child, I'm sure I probably, you know, if I saw my mom's tampons or pads or something like that, I'm sure I probably asked questions, but I rem it was um, a few days after my 11th birthday when I got my period. I remember I was at home and I think I woke up 
and realized that I had my period. There wasn't a whole lot of hoopla, but there wasn't any shame or embarrassment around it either. It's like, oh, my my period's here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. (laughs) Maybe I remember starting out on pads, but that was for a short, maybe two or three periods or something. And I can't remember if I asked my mom for tampons or if my mom had just, you know, given me um, tampons because they were her preference. My mom didn't explain to me how to use the tampons. I think Mm -hmm. she had probably just given me the box or maybe I took it upon myself and went in her room and got the box of tampons. But I think I remember almost going through the whole box of tampons Mm. before I, and I don't, I didn't realize that you have to take them out of the applicator. And so the idea of inserting it in, pushing the tampon up so the applicator can slide off, I was putting the whole thing Oh, mm-hmm. I was push, you know, I was pushing the tampon up and putting the whole thing and not, I didn't understand. I said, it keeps falling out. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I didn't understand that. And, and we talked about, it. she said, no, I, I didn't talk to you because um, really wasn't any reason. She said, I just, it wasn't a thing, you know, uh, my mm-hmm. mom never really talked to me about it and it just wasn't it's just you you get your period. You think it was because she simply didn't talk to you about it or there was also a part of her where she only knew what she learned by herself and not necessarily all the signs behind it and all the things that we should be equipped to know? Exactly. Hmm. There wasn't, she, maybe she didn't know exactly, you know, what to explain Mm. or some people have, and and I understand it, you know, the idea of you get your period and you feel like it's a, almost like a a way of maturing into being a woman now. And if you want to celebrate it that way, like, you know, great. If not Mm. great too, but I think now it, it should be recognized as, okay, this is another aspect of your health, your entire well-being that we have to manage because every single day, it's not just when you get your period, you've now introduced your, once your first period comes, it's almost like your menstrual cycle, your body is now introduced to your menstrual cycle. Mm. And so you are going to start to go through emotional, mental, and physical changes almost on a week to week basis as you're, as you're going, as you're moving throughout the phases Mm -hmm. in your cycle. And so, especially with, uh, I'll speak from uh, the black women's perspective, specifically, you know, when you think about us coming from slavery, where Our bodies were not our own. And so the idea of understanding and learning was not ingrained in us from that. Your body is not yours. And so what does it look like? If you kind of look at the history of what people call the father of gynecology in this country, he was experimenting on on Black women. Mm -hmm. We were test experiments. And so that idea of being connected to and understanding and working with your body and knowing what it takes to be, that's not inherent. Mm. Wow. I think that could also be another conversation on its own. I think I personally would want to learn more about it. So then for young girls or young people, when they experience their period, they would look up to their mom or sisters or the older female around them to explain things. How would you explain it to a teenager who just got their first period? That's actually, um, I hadn't thought about that myself. <laughs> That's a great question. But I'll, I, I think I'll, I'll tell you the way that I think about it now based on what I know is I understand and actually fully agree with what we know about this area of 
menstrual health for women is for the most part, we don't trust our medical providers. It's very sad that you can't trust the information coming from a medical provider. And and the reasons why are mostly because we don't think that they have our personal best interest, Mm. you know, at heart. The idea of just giving me birth control or not, or if I'm experiencing mood swings and you recommend an antidepressant, or if I'm experiencing pain and you just tell me to lose weight, you know, mm. all of these. And and we know that women are going to the people who they trust the most with essentially their lives, their friends and family. Mm. And I actually think that that is very beautiful. It means something. And I think it starts to, when you recognize the value in that, this is a transition and it's a very, depending on how you look at your menstrual cycle and your period, it's a very sacred, healthy. It can be private. Some people like to share. At least now we don't have the blue liquid. I don't think anymore. I don't know if you remember the days or where we had in tampon commercials, it was blue liquid. Mm. No woman bleeds anything. Yes. Blue. Yes. I think, no, no, it still exists now. Okay. I think <laughs> I have, I have tampons, been... Yes. Or, or, you know, like the model or the actress yeah. who plays in these ads, yeah. You know, they're always wearing like pink dress and they, their hair looks mm-hmm. perfect. You know, like there are oh, all these um effects where they're like flowers flashing by you. Uh-huh. That's not real. Yeah. We're so miserable in our period. And even and even the, some of these tampons, the idea of just like being strong and you're yeah. that's not we're going to go through different and it really does the experience, the the gesture I'm making, like it can feel like this, mm-hmm. but I think there is something beautiful and communal, if that if that's the right word to use about this kind of being brought back, happening in the home. I'm going to my mom, I'm talking to my aunts, I'm talking to my older cousins and my sisters and my friends around me. The idea of bringing to me what that introduces it's, it's kind of a deeper level, but the idea of bringing the generation prior to you along with you, mm. it's a way to do that. And mm-hmm. we trust ourselves. I think if we, I think now it's, it's happening out of mistrust, but I think if we look at that intentionally and understand what that could actually mean for society Mm. you know the way I'm explaining it just kind of like bringing people along I think that does a lot more this to me this simple Mm -hmm. this one aspect of our lives of our health I think that does a lot more for building community and this idea of a village like a support system for exactly for young people exactly yeah You mentioned that you probably did a lot of research and interviews so many people, including myself. What are some of the misconceptions or the misunderstandings or assumptions that people have when they view menstrual wellness as a whole? I think that it is, and it's understandable, but I think the idea is that like we're suffering, like it's annoying. And and the thing is, I get it because... Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect in the home Mm -hmm. around, you know, and in our communities and our circles around the education, the information that's required for a mom to pass down to her daughters or an older sister. Mm. And when you go to your healthcare providers, it's just, okay, you've got, you've got some symptoms. Here's, here's some medicine for it. I think that introduces the idea that you should be trained to think that it's an annoyance. Mm. It's something that should be quieted. Mm. There are symptoms versus indicators. Mm -hmm. The pain that we experience is an indication of something. If you think about the idea of fertility health and, and pregnancy and your menstrual cycle, for the most part, we're talking about a lot of the same organs. And so there likely will be some level of discomfort, but to the point where it's debilitating, you can't get out of bed, mm. you know, what is, what could that mean? And for some people, it could be 
changing the foods they eat. Some, some women have the experience of when they cut out meat, they had significantly better experiences, but space isn't made for you to learn your body in that way. Mm, because You have no space. Exactly. Really. Yeah. And so like, for example, I went completely plant-based. I started working out, you know, doing things, but I still had very extreme period pain. When I said I, that wasn't my solution, but not saying that those things don't work because they do. They work for some people, but my body clearly needs something different. I'm doing this with some trial and error, but not quite sure where to go and what the what it looks like to figure out who to turn to, you know, because my mom doesn't know. And so I'm on the journey of, you know, researching and trying things myself traditional medicine, um, Western medicine, as well as, you know, holistic solutions. But the misconception is that it's one that your period and your menstrual cycle are the same thing. Your period is a part of your menstrual cycle and there, and that everything is an annoyance. And for the most part, I think women say, and I just want to say, I totally understand all these things, (laughs) right? You know, they say, I feel like I only get like one or two good weeks every month. But the idea of not understanding, you know, what the phases are, how to take advantage of them. And in the phases where you may be feeling your lowest, there may be, that's a time for rest. You know, that's a time for kind of cutting back on things, being way more mindful about your stress during that time. And also, if you are experiencing significant mood swings, you know, very significant pain, extreme bloating and weight gain and cravings, you know, those are indicators of something. Mm. And I, I do understand the struggle. And that is why her poppy needs to exist of what does it look like? to get through my day to day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What does it look like to get through my, my day to day, just have a better quality of life. And so I want women to know that your periods, your menstrual cycles, I want to flip that mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something to work with, you know, not work on. Exactly. It's something to work with. What does it look like to make space for it in your life? versus just quieting it. And then when it comes up, you're so frustrated and it's, mm-hmm. I'm annoyed. Yeah, that's beautiful. I feel like, especially for young people, mm-hmm. what are some of the personal hygiene t- knowledge that um, most people don't know? You mentioned before that there's some women who are hyper aware about bacteria and that, and that's yeah. why you have the body yeah. mist, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think some basic management things to to start with are um, each each phase of your cycle um, is going to, I don't want to use the word require, um, you'll get the best experience out of certain phases of your cycle if you know how to be prepared. Mm-hmm. And I think understanding what's happening during, well, you know, menstruation phase, for example, and knowing, be prepared with whatever your method is, you know, if it's pads, um, if it's tampons, if it's a menstrual cup or some women free bleed. I also say that with the understanding that access to some of these products and oftentimes the best, you know, best quality products um, is not necessarily always easy to come by. But even just knowing that from a management standpoint, the luteal phase and menstruation phase, those are times when your body is going to require a lot more rest. I know for, you know, the 16 to to 20 year old crew, you may be involved in certain school activities and your schedule may not necessarily be your own, you know, at that age. And and you may not even have, you know, a a full schedule, but the idea of that may be a time where you'll be more tired or you'll have less energy in some ways. um, And there's better terminology for this than, than I'm going to say at the moment, but your brain is kind of, your brain is also operating in a different way where it's going Mm -hmm. to be revealing during your luteal phase, for example, certain things may frustrate you a lot more. They may be things that 
in another part of your cycle, you know, any other day that you would just be able to <laughs> ignore. But some of the frustrations that are coming up, and I actually learned this recently, some of the things that tend to frustrate you a lot more are kind of identifying things that you may need to address. I think the idea of being able to plan things, and and even if you can't plan, and this is what I, I want to be able to do through our, our platform is, you know, daily tips. You know, hey, this may be how you're feeling at that time. Give yourself some extra time because your body may need to move slower. You may need an extra hour, 45 minutes, whatever it is of sleep in the morning. You may need a nap during the day, may not be as sociable. That's okay. Um, I think some help with language around how to communicate that, because I think when it comes to our relationships, whether they're romantic friendships, family, working relationships, you know, I talk about some of those frustrations I think that lack of understanding and emoting in a certain way, Mm -hmm. and it gets misunderstood. You know, people who don't understand what's happening will have a mean response to that, or it must be that time of the month. And when it comes to hygiene and and cleanliness, um, I think there are and this is where having a a good healthcare provider, you know, or even a, a parent or or someone, um, someone older than you, you know, helping you understand these things. The idea of recognizing, being mindful of certain colors of your blood, and what they mean, mm-hmm. making sure that if you are, your body is going to have certain odors blood has a a very particular smell and no and you know for for your individual body knowing what your norm is versus understanding that that may not be someone else's norm and Mm -hmm. not having any shame around Mm -hmm. you know anything that may be happening I think that's more so important for other people to know so we're not putting that shame (laughs) on anyone who may be experiencing yeah. it. But um, I think in general, I know something that I like to practice because I use tampons. So I'm, you know, inserting something, essentially kind of putting my my fingers up in, in my vagina in a way, but clean hands is very, very, very important. important. Kind of as much as you can kind of preventing, you know, spread of, I know we are essentially big bacteria beings in a way. <laughs> I learned this a while back. I think our vagina is actually the most, one of the most absorbent parts of our body. And so, you Mm -hmm. know, when you think about using, even being mindful of if you are using certain tampons or pads, cleaner brands, and I know that's kind of a, a blanket term these days, but being mindful of the kind of cotton that you're inserting, making sure it's not bleached cotton. I think tampon, tampons that kind of pull apart easier, you'll want to be mindful of that because those bits of cotton, you don't want to make sure that that's not left behind um, anywhere mm-hmm. and using things that are made with plastics and, and bleached cotton or anything, those things can be absorbed through your through your vaginal walls and, and your vaginal canals. So being mindful mm-hmm. of that. Right. Even with our, our mist, right? Like not, yeah. definitely not spraying that directly on, you know, around the vulva area, not spraying it inside the vagina. Um, mm-hmm. Because sometimes just learning, if it's not a pleasant smell, investigate that and just masking, mm-hmm. masking, masking all the time it kind of robs you of the opportunity of recognizing changes in your body. And so Mm -hmm. making space for yourself to know, like, what does my blood smell like this month? What's my discharge? Mm -hmm. What's the color of it? You know, making space for things like that and not having any shame and asking about that. Right. And there are certain things too, for example, not a lot of people know that they should change their underwear every six months. And the material of your underwear is also important. 
it should be soft and also I learned that I should wash my underwear separately from the clothes that I wear daily as they could collect dust and sweat and we wouldn't want that to be mixed all together um, there's also other things too that I want to learn more about so for example for hair removal services it is important to be selective about the products you use and I read somewhere that your body hair serves its purpose which is to help protect your bikini area against small articles or friction it, it does definitely serve a purpose all the parts of your body that that grow hair essentially serve a purpose i know we kind of live in a different time and and culture now you know the idea of going to the beach and having those things or just some people just have preferences with with no body hair i think what's in you know maybe the most Im- important you know thing to understand there is just doing what's what's comfortable and healthiest you know for for yourself one woman or or a person may have a reaction to you know the the next five you know may necessarily not um but the idea of knowing and making space for what's comfortable for you, respecting others' decisions, you know, when it comes to when it comes to that area as well. And our our body is going to, especially when it comes to our reproductive health, menstrual cycle, vaginal health, like it's going to change, you know, over time and stress life experiences, exciting experiences. Obviously your body knows how to register like stress feelings versus excitement. Um, How do you like to take care of yourself when you're on your period? It's interesting that you asked that question because I was was away at at a summit. I was on a panel and um, the ladies that I was with, I'm you know, very familiar with them. And and we've kind of, we've done these summits a few times now. And I told them I was on my period and they said, oh my God, Poppy's on her period. They said, what is it like? <laughs> and I said, it's not that glamorous. I would say I do my best to give myself time to rest. Um, I do still experience painful periods, still on the journey of what that, you know, looks like for me and understanding what's happening in my body now is going to show up in my cycle, you know, in my period specifically, probably in the next 60 to 90, maybe 120 days, because Mm. the experience that you're having with your period in your cycle now is kind of the result of what was happening. I think they say on average, maybe about 90 days ago. There are times when you just have to push through, like, for example, this past week, um, I was I was traveling for work. I'm out of my element. I don't have my normal things, you know, on hand. And I did not get as much rest as I wanted to. I'm home today and it's a rainy day. So you better believe I'm catching up on my rest <laughs> today. Some of my biggest things are um, getting making time for extra rest. If I can, um, I'll actually clear my schedule as much as possible just to allow myself mm-hmm. a bit more freedom and, and flexibility. Um, water, 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 and more water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay attention to how I'm feeling to see what it is, honestly, that that I want at that time and understand if there are certain emotions that come up that are maybe Mm -hmm. sad or hurtful make space for them allow them to be what they are fully stocked as always on her poppy (laughs) 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 I'm having a little bit of fun now experimenting I don't want to call it experimenting but switching Mm. out the products like this particular period I was using pads Mm. a lot than I normally do. Mm. I don't know what it was. I was using pads a lot more than I normally do. My, not the period before this one, but I think a couple of periods before um, I was experimenting with the menstrual cup and kind of playing around Mm. with that. I'm having, for me, what I call a little bit of Mm -hmm. fun right now, 
testing out. Yeah. yeah, those are things that I do. And if I want to treat myself to something, you know, a particular something to eat, I'm going to mm-hmm. do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's this um, Korean snack thing. It's called Pocky. It's like chocolate cover, like a, a biscuit stick. Uh, oh, I know what those are. I know what those are. Yeah, the, it's like very specific that every time, like before my period, I need to stock up on that. I know what that. Yes. Yeah. Lauren and her poppy team put together a wonderful guide that explains four phases of the menstrual cycle, how you can tap into your superpower, and tips for you to take care of yourself in each phase. Phase one is the menstruation phase, aka when you're in your period. You may experience cramping, fatigue, and mood swings because your body is experiencing hormonal changes. During this phase, you may want to be more in sync with your intuition and feelings, make decisions you've been putting off in your personal life and career, you want to be gentle with yourself, and it is okay to have low energy level. Don't forget to hydrate, opt for gentle exercises rather than intense training, and eat nutritious food. Phase 2 is the follicular phase where eggs mature in your ovaries. You may feel higher energy and focus compared to phase 1. You can use this time to brainstorm or start a new project. Do whatever works for you, but again, don't be too hard on yourself. Phase 3 is ovulation, which is the main event of the menstrual cycle where one feels most fertile. Communication and collaboration are your superpowers during this phase so it's the prime time for important conversations and social meetings, not to mention more sexual energy. Phase 4 is the luteal phase where your body prepares for the possibility of pregnancy. You may experience a range of symptoms, mood changes, anxiety, breast tenderness, bloating, weight gain, increased appetite, and fatigue. During this phase, you may be very task-oriented, so use the time to be productive with your to-do list. Take it easy and prepare yourself mentally and physically for the next cycle. Treat yourself to whatever you're craving and listen to your body. 